Hello everyone, and um, yeah, thanks for coming for, to this week's webinar, which will, all, which will be all about um, different business models for food enterprises. Um, we've got four guest speakers today um, who have agreed to join us and talk about their amazing food enterprises. We've got Alex from New Dawn Traders, Doro from Local Ball, Al from Health and Local Food Hub, and we've got Kathy and Candice from New Pantry Glass. So thanks everyone for joining us. I'm gonna record the session so I just want to say to anyone who's attending, feel free if you prefer to have your video off, that's okay. Um, obviously keep it on if you want to, that's also great. Um, and if you have any questions during the session, um, drop them into the chat. We're going to have about 15 minutes at the end um, where you can ask questions for any of our, any of our speakers today. Um, but just so you don't forget them, um, pop them in the chat if you have them in the meantime, and we'll get to all of those questions first at the end. Um, just a few more people in the waiting room and we'll get started in just a minute. Cool. Great. Okay. I'm recording the session. So, oh, so thanks everyone for coming. And I'm going to start with you, Alex, if that's okay. If you'd like to tell us all about the wonderful New Dawn Traders, um, that'd be amazing. Hello. Um, yeah, so I, my business is called New Dawn Traders. I work with sailing vessels to import and export cargo, mainly food, um, across the oceans. The ship I work with is called Gallant. It's a, um, about a 90 foot schooner that was built 100 years ago in Holland, uh, the Netherlands. And um, it is run by a French company and they have, the ship just arrived a couple of days ago in the Caribbean um which is very nice for them <laughs> to be in the sunshine and they will be sailing back in the spring with coffee and cocoa beans and panela sugar um and then in the summer they sail down to portugal and back and pick up olive oil and almonds and wine and um and also salt from france um we i've been really inspired by food movements and local food movements around like community supported agriculture and models like that. And really wanted to take, see if we could expand that system, trade system beyond oceans with sailing vessels um, as they travel with the wind and therefore um, uh, do not pollute as much. And um, yeah, and so I was really looking for a tool like the Open Food Network for a while before I discovered it. And it was a real sort of like light bulb moment because it, um, it really uh, was exactly the thing that we needed. Um, how our system works is that we start collecting early bird pre-orders on an open food network order cycle, really as far in advance as we can ahead of the ship actually arriving. And then people can share in people who invest in the voyage that early are sort of rewarded with a uh, with the lowest price. So it's more or less um, buying the products at the cost of the product and the transport. And then they can also come and collect the order from the ship where it, when it comes in, um, which is really exciting. So you can help unload and get to meet the ship and see the meet the sailors and everything um and the next and then we get the pre the early bird pre-orders run until the ship um until we place the order with the producers the farmers once the order is placed we run a second order cycle um for pre-orders which we collect on whilst the ship is en route to its destination um, and then we also have monthly retail order cycles for the cargo that we have here um, after the ships arrived. So that way we give our customers like every opportunity to get involved as early as possible. And our hope really is to build that trust that they have in us and the quality of the products that we bring, that they will be willing to invest earlier and earlier um, so that we can financially feel more secure that the ship is, full, is filled with cargo and everything's paid for even before they've um, left the producer. And that works out really well for the farmers because they can really plan, um, 
they know what they're getting. So they, we can pay them as soon as we load the cargo. The ship can also be paid as soon as they deliver. Um, and it feels like a much healthier trading system um, than the sort of default system that w- works around what we do. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's about it, I think. <laughs> that's sort of the, a summary of how, how we operate. Um, yeah, happy to answer any questions later. Awesome, thank you, Alex. Yeah, I, I, I think I was um, uh, one of the early adopters on your first order cycles in, in Bristol, and I remember buying just amazing amounts of olive oil and, and wine um, from, your first, from your first one then. It's amazing. And also my partner bought me some amazing rum for my birthday from yeah. your trade, well, <laughs> which I still have, and it's delicious. So, yeah, thanks for sharing your really unique model. Um, really appreciate it. And now we're going to pass on to something... Um, very different. Al, if you would like to talk about health and local food hubs, that would be that would be amazing. Do you need me to share okay. the slides? Yeah. So okay? I, I, yeah, I did. I've, I've got a few pages, so if I can share my screen. Cool. I'll just with you all. Um, there we go. I've just made it okay, so you should be able to click share screen and share your slides. Right. Can everyone see that? Um, we can see, I think you've just shared your, um, yeah, yeah, we can see it. Perfect. Thanks, Al. Okay. Um, okay. So just to help, well, just really for me to help me, I've just drew a few notes up to what, I, what I'll talk about with Helston. So Helston is down in southwest Cornwall, the small, small market town of about I think 12,000 people. Um, and has had a very monthly farmers market since 2008, and really, yeah, you know, surprisingly successful. I think most producers felt um, for a place like Helston, but it was all for, for some reason it really clicked with people locally. But um, but we always had a had a feeling that uh, it would be better for customers and for producers if there was a way of um, of it being more frequent than than just every month. And I'd come across um, Stroudco uh, and realised that that could be the opportunity that we were that we were looking for because we couldn't get producers to commit to to once a month. There were other markets they were attending to, so um, so Stroudco seemed 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 gave me the idea that we could do something similar in Helston, and I had been sort of thinking about it for a number of years, but until my sort of situation changed and wasn't really able to do anything until I had more time this year. And I'd started, I'd started discussing it with, with the producers before COVID came along. Um, but obviously when it did come along, we had to move a lot more quickly because the farmer's market closed and a lot of those producers had lost their market altogether. So I sort of moved uh, as more quickly than I was expecting to and set up Helston Local Food Hub. Um, we started with some of the farmers market producers, those that were felt able to to join in or wanted to join in. Initially, there were ten of them, um, and and we sort of set up. So we we were setting up from scratch with all new procedures, etc. Um, and we've grown from those original ten to uh, it says twenty five. I'm not sure I counted that. I think I just sort of guessed. It's somewhere around that that figure um, of 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 producers. Um, we were really lucky in that the farmers, the space that the farmers market in was available to us to rent every Saturday morning, which was when we wanted to do the, the food hub. And um, and it was a great, it was a great space. And so in the beginning when we um, under the first lockdown uh, and whilst we were getting our systems in place, we we had a lot of space, we had a huge space to work in. And we had, um, we sort of went with family volunteering. So my family sort of volunteered, and um, and another volunteer, his family worked together. So we had lots of people working, but we were able to keep separate in our in our uh, family family bubbles. Um, and we started. You know, the, it was the first the first week was I limited it, I think, to twenty orders. I sort of got caught out. Twenty five orders went within within twelve hours, and uh, and that was a thing about. Uh, 1,200 pounds turnover in that for that first week, 
and it's quite interesting really because it's not it hasn't sort of it's it's been pretty steady since this is we, this first the first market was in may and it's been pretty steady since there uh, of around a thousand to to 1250 sometimes it's been been more um and sometimes it's been quite a bit quite a bit less but it's but it's around that that sort of figure and around 25 orders would be would be a would be a sort of average with some very regular customers and um and and a sort of slowly growing number of new customers each each week we get one or one or two more although interestingly in the last two weeks i've had more new customers i think i've had since than i've had since june so something sort of something sort of changing there so we work on a weekly order cycle every saturday morning uh, we close we close the order cycle on a thursday lunchtime and every saturday morning producers bring their produce to the the old cattle market in Helston, uh, me and one other person um, pack the orders, and the customers come between quarter to quarter to eleven and twelve o'clock. And we um, and I have a couple of uh, of collection points in other villages around. So just think about what went what went well. Um, and I was yeah start starting from scratch so i lent very heavily on other people and borrowed as much of what i could from other people's processes and procedures strike particularly uh tamar food hub and others um really helped me in those in those early days and i was i was serial attender every single zoom meeting that was that was going at that time to help me uh try and get my head around it and to and to make it work well so those those weekly sport webinars really really helped um both in the sort of setting up and the procedure stuff but also in the marketing um of which i had you know, little experience and no experience of facebook and things like that so all the you know, case really helpful uh webinars were of massive benefit i think to to how we were able to to get going and keep going um we've used that scheduled collection times at the, the uh, and uh platform allows us to do and that's um just yeah originally just for social distancing i guess that's carried on but it just makes for a much easier and um more more steady and relaxed um time for people to collect there's no there's no real queuing and sometimes you know we have a chance to chat to to, to the customers a little bit as well which which feels really important um i think the community collection points i've just done a couple uh, on the Lizard Peninsula, one close to my home at the end of the at the end of the day, and another one in in one of the larger villages, and they've been really uh, they've been pretty crucial in some ways, and sometimes they've been sort of fifty percent of my of my orders have come from those two communities, and uh, so that's been good from my point of view, but it's also been good from um, from that from well certainly during the first lockdown you could see that it was becoming something of a community gathering each week people would get together and they would you know they'd be bringing books to swap with each other and 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 it was sometimes the only time that they would get to see people and and they would um and in one of my early collection points in mullion you know there were there were a couple they hadn't seen each other for for you know two, two months or something so they they work really well and they, and they feel quite strong and they're sort of growing as well so that's so that's good i think there was a lot of yeah you know, we were i was quite tight on the procedures in terms of mask wearing and sanitizer and, and the general space around uh, that we were that we were able to have at the, at the farmers market where we did the collection point i think really helped people felt very confident in that um in that environment and and i suppose that's and that's partly because you know we the customer base is comes i think from the farmers market and the demographic is is retired people so people who are probably a little bit more vulnerable at this time so a large number of my of my customers are from that from that demographic and i think that um the the procedures we put in place were helpful for them in, uh feeling confident about coming to the to the food hub um, more recently we've Done donations to the local food bank, and that's been that's been pretty successful. Really, getting sort of 
70 to 80 pounds uh, each each week and a lot more around around christmas time so that's just the one pound or a five pound um button on the on the uh on the shop front that people can uh can donate to and i think the other thing that really has really helped me along the way has been some big sellers so um whilst uh so well it's, it's probably principally actually one one big seller um of a uh, Ruby Jeans Indian cuisine, which is a local uh, curry um, curry maker, and that just has sold really well. And sometimes it's been twenty five percent of my uh, of my sales, and so that's it's, it's quite a significant number. That's, and I guess partly lockdown is you know, the, the the pubs uh, have I've been, I've been closed or people have been been so keen on going to them. So that's that's really helped, and a couple of established names, and I guess also the having the the base of the farmers market um, has has um, given us a lot of uh, sort of regular um, regular and loyal and loyal customers from from that uh, from those people. Uh, so some of the challenges uh, I think we need to sort of need to grow the customer base. It's not doesn't feel like it's quite it isn't quite big enough to 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 make it really sustainable for the amount of um work that goes in in terms of the the uh the output um or the income coming into the to the business um because we started in a bit of a hurry i never really did any sort of guidelines or standards around what producers should should do you know would are we looking for organic are we looking for regenerative farming practice practices and things like that and because i was starting with established farmers market producers i wasn't really able to necessarily to um to put any guidelines around those i just sort of grabbed the people that were there and and i suppose some of the standards around product sourcing particularly for so for example what, what some of the the um secondary secondary produce where people are making curries or pies or anything like that I'm not 100 percent sure where they where they're sourcing all their products and are they sourcing their products locally and we haven't sort of built a, a structure around that um yet and um and i think we just need to widen the demographic a little bit and and the reach of the reach of the, of the food hub around elston and i've been operating as a sole trader with sort of limited limited resources so it was basically just me and Usually my daughter or my son helping me on a, on, a, on a Saturday, so it feels a little bit fragile. If um, if I was to go off ill, I have got some volunteers who are able to help, but it's, it it probably doesn't feel particularly um, resilient um, going forward. And um, I'd like to see some changes there. And finally, next steps. Um, I think what I'm wanting to do now is to widen the product list to more everyday items. It's kind of based around farmers market quite quite a lot of sort of luxury luxury items there less of the day-to-day -day stuff um i've been talking about it i haven't done anything about it um but whether we should form a community interest company i think would be pretty valuable and then i could build those guidelines around that and clarify those objectives and, and the values for what we what we stand for and then looking at how do we how do we widen the geographic reach and I've, talking to other food hubs close by and other people thinking there are other people in West Cornwall thinking along the same line. So we're looking at how we can how we can reach out a bit further than just Helston and use and scale up really to something that could be bigger and more uh, bigger and therefore more sustainable. And and I think the other thing I want to do is to is and again I guess we come around our clarifying our objectives and values, but how we sort of partner with with a, a local food bank or other uh, organisations uh, addressing issues around um, food insecurity and things like and things like that, which um, would be one of the things I'd really wanted to see out of out of this out of this project. But it's something that beyond the the sort of donation button, I haven't been able haven't been able to do. But it's early days, so we've been running for since May this year, and. Um, and I'm pretty pleased that it's where we've got what we've got so far, but 
me to go a little bit further. That's that's my lot. Okay, thanks. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Al. Um, such an interesting and inspiring story to hear how you, yeah, how how things move so quickly for you. Can we with ask Al. questions? Um, so what we're going to do, if that's okay, if you've got any questions in the meantime, um, if you would pop them into the chat and we're going to get to them at the end, well, we should have about 15 minutes, if that's okay. Um, do you know how to find the chat? Um, the chat's just, ah, there we go. Okay, cool. It's the bottom right. So if you want to add um, your questions there and we'll get to them at the end, if that's okay. Um, so Al, yeah, thanks so much for your share. Um, I'm really inspiring to hear um, the direction that you want to take the hub in and the new yeah, the new things that you're thinking about doing and particularly around bringing in more essential items and widening the demographic and yeah, so it's really exciting to hear that. So thanks for sharing. Um, so next we're gonna pass on to Kathy um, and Candice, if that's okay. And they're gonna share, thanks. Hi, yes, um, I'm Kathy, as you can see from the uh, note. Candice is just gonna sit in the background and uh, metaphorically poke me if, if I say something wrong. Um, we set up a zero waste shop in our local town, Flandilo in South Wales, uh, 18 months ago. And it was purely as a physical shop that we set it up. Um, but part of what we were looking to do was to take on some local producers um, on various things. And one of those that we worked with is a uh, small holding. Uh, gross organic standards and they would let us they would bring in uh, fruit and fruit mainly uh, veg mainly during the week and that sort of thing so it was we were ticking along nicely growing nicely we supplemented locally grown veg with some from a local wholesaler um, organic stuff here in Wales um, mainly because you have to get in your lemons and your ginger and that sort of thing um, when lockdown hit, uh, we had a manic couple of weeks just before lockdown when everybody was stocking up on rice and pasta and that sort of thing. As we went into lockdown, we thought, well, what are we going to do now? Candice and I had both worked on a local food hub previously that used OFN. So we just went, let's use OFN. We know it. We can load things up quickly. Um, so we moved everything online. Um, we had a lot of shielding customers who were very grateful for that because nobody could get supermarket slots or anything like that. If you did get a supermarket slot, you never had any idea what you were going to get. Whereas with OFN, the stock that we put online is what stock we had in the shop. Once somebody had ordered that, the stock levels went down and if we ran out, then that, that was shown online so so that worked fairly well um we had rather than being open five six days a week we were just um open for pickups on a friday and a saturday and did some local deliveries uh if people traveled from further afield they were, were often willing to meet us part way uh, whilst socially distancing that was candace's well-managed role there. Um, following the sort of first lockdown, we've been slowly opening and extending our physical shop hours. We don't let people now serve themselves as is the aim of zero waste shop. So unfortunately, a lot more stuff is going into paper bags, but we are willing to handle and fill people's containers in the shop if they bring them in. Um, we still have a fair number, probably 50% plus of our takings will be online orders and people pick them up. So we uh, prepare the orders and then people collect on a Friday. Um, we have found in, that we're growing our fruit and veg side more. We've got a lot more of that now coming through the shop because again, I think people are finding if they reserve it with us, we're going to supply them with what they've ordered. Some of the jars and containers from the shop are a bit more of a challenge. I only put half of the stock levels online because we also have people walking up and buying things. Um, 
So we haven't had too many disasters yet, but uh, it is occasionally worrying that we will have the stock for someone who's ordered something in plenty of time. So stock management is, is one of our, our challenges. Um, one of the other challenges is in maintaining our pricing um, because um, as prices change, um, I work out what we're going to be charging through a, a spreadsheet, but then you have to update OFN and we have to update our till and then possibly also update signs and things like that in the shop. So that can be a challenge. Um, I'm bouncing around a bit. I do apologize. Initial stock upload, we did it ourselves. Um, I do know that uh, OFN do offer that as a service. And um, if my spreadsheet had been better organized, I probably would have taken them up on it. But I knew I'd have to spend a lot of time in tidying up my spreadsheet. So we, we um, uploaded things manually. Um, And I think that's it. I'm running out of things to say at the moment. To so say we're we're physical and online. We run a permanently open order cycle. Uh, we just ask that people order the day before, so that we've got a chance to pack things. One or two of them always miss that. Um, if we're lucky, we spot their order and we get about an hour to pack it before they arrive to collect. Um, we do have a couple of other online of other suppliers. One of them is someone who's been making some organic, slow, um, proved donuts and bread and that sort of thing. Um, and the challenge there was that that those items she needed the order by Thursday morning for Friday delivery. So we would have to manually go in, take all the stock off center the order and then on a saturday we put all the stock back on again for the following week so that's a bit manual and we tend to do the same with the fruit and veg in the shop as well that um, we will take stock off on a sort of a friday so that we can sell to walk ups quite comfortably and know that we will have um, anything that people have ordered um, available to for uh, packing. And um, yeah, I think I'll find out a thing to say. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Kathy. It's really interesting to hear your perspective with kind of juggling the, the shop and the online presence as well. So thank you so much for sharing that. And I think it's a really awesome service that if you're able to kind of pack and um, your customers are able to collect something within an hour, I mean, that's, like, that's an incredible kind of juggling turnaround. So thanks for thanks for sharing. Um, so we're going to speak to the last of our speakers now, which is Doro from the local from the local Glasgow. Um, Doro, are you okay to share now? Yeah. Hello everyone. Hi. I'm Doro. Um, I'm working in the local work. Um, local work is um, a pretty sprawling food project these days. Um, so local work started in 2011 and it was founded as um, basically a social enterprise that wants to build a better food system. Um, so that was a kind of small remit there. Um, we started off with a really small neighborhood shop um, that basically never made any money. And, um, and then in order to shift uh, our produce a bit faster, we started a veg box scheme where we delivered, like I think it started off with like 20 veg boxes that got delivered in the neighborhood with a bicycle. And, um, and then that kind of grew quite a bit, the veg boxes over the years. And, um, and also we moved into a bigger shop to uh, try to have an offer that would actually support like woodwork as a business um, and where people would want to shop. Um, and, um, and so we did that and, and kind of grew from there. So we've always been very open to any offers that people would make us. Um, so we were offered some land to grow food on and we were really we are, like we were quite keen on growing so we did that um, it was a bit of a disaster for a couple of years but 
I think this year we have finally made a profit for the first time ever. So um, don't give up. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's all just really grown from there. So the veg box scheme is really big now. We deliver about, um, I think, 1,500 veg boxes a week um, all over the central belt in Glasgow. Um, it used to be a bit more, I think it'll probably go up again this year because we closed signups at some point because we were just a bit overwhelmed. But I think this year um, that will increase again. And, um, and we also worked on move, uh, moving into a bigger shop and we moved into a pretty nice property in 2018. And that's now proper kind of supermarket size you know not like a huge supermarket but like kind of a local Sainsbury's or something like that and that has a pretty pretty good offer of like everything you might want to buy um to eat like you can get you have a pretty complete offer there and I think that kind of developed out of like this when we started off we were very strict in our like buying rules so we would only have um food from Scotland or the UK since we are a local war and it's all about the local food. But at some point we just kind of realized that if we do that, we just stay incredibly niche because at the moment, the way the food system is, there just isn't, like we're just not producing the full range of things you want in the UK. So we kind of decided it was better to like import some things or buy import stock imported products and, you know, and use the profit we make off that to work towards something better and more local. And that's kind of what we've been doing um and um we've uh we've taken on um we ended up that was another accident um we ended up taking on one of our wholesalers who when the owner wanted to retire a couple of years ago and um and that's been really um that, that's really made a huge difference because you know we, we buy that means we buy olive oil and pasta and tin tomatoes and tin beans and all that direct and um and that means we can we have pretty competitive prices on that and we just have a really good broad offer um and we also supply about 100 shops around the uk um with that um i think a lot of what we do like we always try things and then they don't work so well for a while until we figure it out so I think one of the questions that Kay sent over was like so what's you know what would you do what would you do differently or like what's your you know what would your business plan be now and I think that's really difficult to say because I think we did need those phases of trying things out and then learning from it and I think you really need like it's you're not going to figure out straight away what works in your neighborhood or in your community so you will have those you know you will try things and they won't work and then you'll either figure out what will work instead or you'll you know you'll just stop doing that or, so I think so I don't have like this recipe um we also like one of the things that didn't work so well for us was like we took over a cafe from some friends that wanted to move on and we opened it in March so that was quite unfortunate uh, it was open for 10 days then it shut um and we still don't really know how to come back to that because Glasgow has been pretty much in lockdown for most of the time and it's been kind of the hot spot with coronavirus in Scotland so I don't know when when we'll stop being that so yeah <laughs> we'll see um we had some really good help along the way setting it all up uh, I think one of the really good things we did was set up as a community interest company which meant that we qualify as a social enterprise and that means that especially in Scotland we have really good access to funding at the moment we don't really get much funding anymore because you're pretty self-sustaining these days like the shop makes good money the veg box makes good money it all kind of pays for itself and that's amazing but obviously it took us a couple of years to get there and in that time, it was really helpful to have, you know, funding from First Port, for example, who give a lot of money to social enterprises in Scotland, and then there's Social Investment Scotland. And it just generally opens up more sources of income if you are a social enterprise. And uh, alongside that, I also think it's the right thing to do. Like, I don't want us to be a company where, you know, shareholders benefit and the community doesn't. So, um, but yeah, it also has these practical advantages. And then the other thing that was super useful was getting help from other like-minded businesses. So in 2000, 
2015, I think, when we were thinking about opening a big, bigger shop, the um, basically the entire shop team, which then was about four people, we went to Manchester and did a like, week-long placement with uh, Unicorn, which is a big independent grocery. Um, it's a workers' co-op, and they've been going since the 90s really successfully. And... Um, and that was just a completely different level from what we were at. Um, and it was just really amazing to see how, how they work. And they were really generous. Um, they basically let us shadow everything they did for about, for a week. I think I, me and Ruben, um, Ruben is the, is the founder of Local. We stayed for two weeks and everyone else was one week. And that was just amazing. And we're still kind of drawing on that, you know, kind of just seeing processes they had in place. And even if we didn't have time, like, or we weren't at the stage to implement that, straight away it was just really helpful to see that and kind of know what we're aiming for or kind of you know look at some things they did and go like oh we don't really want to do that let's see if we can do something different so I'd really recommend just like checking out places that kind of inspire you and I've generally found that people are really helpful but it is good if you know what you're what what you what you're asking so like don't go in with the big philosophical questions of how should I run things but like if you have a question like I don't know what tool software to use, do you like yours? Like people will be really happy to talk to you. Like we've just been switching our tool system, for example, which is why I came up with that example. And it's been really amazing. I've been calling lots of shops, um, bigger shops that you know probably have a similar turnover to ours, and was just asking how they're finding it. And I found people were really happy to tell me everything they hated about their system, and um, and things that they liked as well. So that was really useful. So just look at. Other, sh other places you like and that you kind of want to be like and, and talk to them and um, yeah and don't be too discouraged if your first attempt at something doesn't work quite as well as you hoped um, like we did lots of stuff that never worked out like we started an online shop when the pandemic hit it was a disaster because our stock tracking wasn't good enough and whereas the open food network that we use in conjunction with the veg boxes has its own stock so that's that was fine but actually doing online sales from our shop did not work and maybe we'll get back to it someday you know and we tried like the cafe didn't work out yet might later and um, you know and we had all the normal issues of like you know like a, of a growing business it's just difficult because people's roles change and the atmosphere changes if you go from like five members of staff to we're now at a hundred so you have you have these big changes and they're just hard and I think there's no way of not having them be painful you know um, I think it's just trying your best and yeah kind of yeah not not giving up basically um, but yeah I think generally I'm in a pretty good position now um, and if you're looking at now we're looking at um, opening more shops um, we just opened a second shop um, in a different part of Glasgow and that was really exciting because it felt like you could really tell that we learned a lot from the first time we did it and it just felt a lot easier and less painful and it wasn't yeah like I think the first one was just like this really existential stressful experience the big shop and this one was just oh it's fine we know what we're doing so that was really nice um, so we're looking to do more shops um, and also I think just finding more local producers because like um with the amount of vegetables we sell through the veg boxes and the shops, um, we could really do with, uh, with with more local suppliers. Like our, the farm that we buy, buy all our onions from runs out sooner every year, so we kind of need more, and uh, and that's something that I'm really excited about doing that. Um, yeah, so that's that's more exciting thing than the future. Um, I think that's kind of my overview. But yeah, if you have questions, bring them on. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. And congratulations on your second shop. So that's great Thank news. <laughs> yeah, it's really exciting. I really like it. Hey. Awesome. So thanks everyone for sharing. And now we've actually got um, a really decent amount of time for Q&A. &A. We've got 20 minutes. So yeah, I'm thinking, first of all, if um, maybe if we look at, at what we'll, we'll Maybe go to the chat first, because I think there are quite a lot of there have been quite a lot of questions and talk in the chat. Um, so I'm trying to think the best way to do this, whether it's to have questions that are on people's minds now or if we just go to the chat. But I think I might go to the chat first. The first question was for Alistair from Rachel. 
Um, and Rachel asked if you could provide more details on the practicalities of running community pickup locations. And I don't know if you've got to that in the rest of the chat, Elle, um, but have you got something to share on that? So just to unmute myself. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I did. Um, I did respond in the chat. I, mean, I, I just we do our pickups in a couple of, of uh, car parks, one in a cafe car park and one in a public car park in the village. Um, it's pretty simple. We just, I just, it's a, it's a, it's a set time each week. Um, and I charge one pound for, in it, there's a shipping charge of one pound unless people pay more than I think 20 or 25 pounds. Um, and, a van was being pretty essential for that. Uh, it's um, just because number of orders to 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 pack, uh, and it's pretty simple, really. Uh, not that many orders. I mean, it's not a huge numbers of orders at, at each place. So social distancing has always been quite uh, simple. Um, and I suppose, I suppose the best bit of advice on that one was, I think. Uh, in the cafe car park in the small village that I do that we we do do that in, I think just because the person who runs the cafe is a very sort of strong influencer in the village that drew a lot of orders in and people wanted to come and it, and it sort of tied in quite nicely with their business as well because people could have a cup of coffee at the at the same time as they as they came to collect so that was um, that worked pretty well uh, but other, yeah it's it's it is pretty simple just. 12, 15 each day, come and collect. I suppose just the, the other challenge, I suppose, was keeping stuff cold long enough. So I just bought a really good insulated um, freezer, freezer box thing. And um, that's that's that was probably the only early challenge was just keeping stuff cold for long enough um, during, during the day and in the summer as well. Okay, do you mind if I just quickly butt in? Yeah, sure. Sorry, just to finish off on that question. Um, Al, so are you saying that you pack in one place, you pack it all into a van, you go to your first pickup location, and then you, everyone picks up from there and you move on to the second one. Is that the idea? Yeah, yeah. so, so uh, the main place is in, is in Helston, the market town. So most people generally are coming to that place. So we do, we do that with the scheduled time slots. When that finishes, we clear out of there. We put it. We we've done all the packing yeah. in, it, within the first hour um, or hour and a half, and then um, and then we we clear out of that place, pack, go into the van, and um, and then drive to one place. It doesn't take very long. People are really great at turning up, and this, the the main problem is if people don't pitch up, and you've got their order and they've forgotten or something. But generally, people have been really good at that. And then just go on, and then just go on to the next place and and finish off. I mean, I, yeah. Um, Sarah at Tamar Grow Local has got a much more complicated and uh, setup of, of delivering and collection points. Mine's pretty straightforward. Thank you. Um, the next question is, is directed at Doro, and it was um, from Rachel as well. How do you vet your producers before they come on board? Is, do you have any producer vetting process? Yeah, so that's um, changed over time. Uh, nowadays, we are organic only. So there's very few exceptions for that. We have one honey supplier that's not organic who produces honey in Glasgow. But wherever possible, it's organic and we don't. Um, and if we get in touch with a new supplier, like last year, we started a partnership with, Cal with Cal Caldwell Farm in Ayrshire and he was, the farmer was interested in organic but wasn't organic so um, we agreed to buy a part of his crop on the condition that he would go into, um, um, he, he would convert to organic basically. So, um, so that's really important for us. Um, so, so that's the base the basic thing that we want is our suppliers to be organic um and then you know and then we have like as a criteria like generally if you know an independent chain uh, like if independent brand gets bought up by a huge multinational we discontinue them for someone a bit more 
independent. Um, that's a bit more, um, yeah. That kind of depends on what it is, but that's generally what we do. Um, and then we just generally aim to source as locally as possible. Um, but that obviously then also depends on the product, how local that can be. And we generally try to buy from um, kind of other enterprises that kind of um, are set up to do something good in, in the world, you know, like, so, um, sorry. Um, so, so I think I'd prefer to buy from cooperatives or other social enterprises if they, you know, if they offer um, what we need. Yeah. Great, thanks, Doro. Um, so there was a general question that came up a couple of times, and that was about the best um, marketing tactics that you've, you've had in finding new customers or reaching customers. I'm wondering if each of the, the speakers today could just give us a highlight of some of the things that they've done that's worked the best for them. I'll, I'll chip in. Um, I think we're still modeling our way through on the marketing side we don't really not too certain quite how we managed to get customers um before we opened i ran a facebook survey that seemed to get some interest uh we did a crowdfunding exercise and when we first opened it was people visiting the hairdressers and the dentists that walked past and wondered what we were we weren't a clothes shop anymore um, and I think from there, it's been word of mouth as much as anything that has worked well for us. Um, Candice and uh, our, our third person, Faye, is working hard on trying to get social media going to get gather more interest that way. Have anything to add, Candice? Uh, yeah, um, in the new year, we've just started in, um, with a monthly newsletter. Um, and we're doing little features on uh, some of our producers and also adding in a few easy to make recipes with some of the ingredients that we stock. Um, also sharing other posts. So we sell quite a lot of Hodmadods, which is a UK grower of beans and pulses. So it's just reminding ourselves that we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. We can share other suppliers posts. Um, that's quite easy if you haven't got much time. Um, and then looking for other networks, building the networks through Instagram. Um, and yeah, there's, and just looking and um, building the web, I think um, networks are important. So I've um, been on a optimizing um, Wales's food and natural um, harvest supply chains with uh, Business Wales today in a workshop um, and found quite a lot of people that I didn't know exist. So it's constantly looking for projects in your area, uh, looking for producers and um, yeah, building, building networks really, building the local food network. Great tips, thank you. Um, I just wanna to go to Al with that question next, because I know Al, you have to leave at 10 too, don't you? So we've got three minutes of your, your time before you go, so. Okay, thanks Kate. Um, yeah, I, well, I think I, we, our initial flurry of orders, I think probably came through the house, the farmer's markets, Facebook. So I was, I was making sure that they were posting stuff about the Food Hub there. Um, I think um, word of mouth clearly is the, the, the best way. And I think a lot of people come through that to me. Facebook has been pretty useful. Um, I, don't have any, I don't have any figures particularly on that. Um, but I do a weekly newsletter. And, and, um that's uh and you can just see the orders come as soon as you send a, a newsletter out you can see the orders coming in straight away and it's just a reminder for people and i think i think for lots of people when you people that have been regular shoppers and then drop off if i'm if i get back in touch with them again it's almost invariably they've just they've just got out of the habit of it and i think that weekly reminder really really sort of helps keep people Coming to, to come to us more regularly. Uh, so I, do, I, mean, I do two emails a week. One is a newsletter on the Monday, which has got more information about any new produce and things like that. And then on the Wednesday evening, it's just a one liner really that says, don't forget to get your orders in by, th by tomorrow lunchtime. And that's, um, that, does seem, that does seem to help. That's great, thank you. Um, just before you go, Al, does anyone have any last questions for Al um, before he leaves? Yes, I had the one 
which was after the marketing one. How do you pack your orders, Al? I have problems because I want to pack them in paper carriers, um, but find that they break so easily. What do you use? Uh, we use those uh, plastic crates like they do in supermarkets. Um, so we pack all the orders, it, uh, like the vegetable, the vegetable, plastic vegetable crates. We we pack all the orders into those, and then when people come, they pack that they unpack them out of that into their own shopping bags. Um, and then we have the cold stuff. We have an insulated uh, carrier bag with ice packs inside it. Um, so that keeps stuff cool for long enough um, and those people just unpack those and um, into their own into their own bags and usually steal them with little ice packs on the, on the way because they're picking the, all the stuff out they just seem to take the ice pack with them as well but that's that's that works pretty that works that works pretty well um, but it's just yeah it's insisting people bring their own their own bags and those and those those vegetable crates are are sturdy and um, and easily cleaned and we start off with the cardboard boxes from the supermarket um just picking them from that from there but they tend to fall apart and get a bit grubby so the plastic ones are are better and long lasting but uh, yeah i do sorry i've got another meeting at six o'clock so i need to go but um if anyone's got any any other queries then just um you can okay you could probably share my email address so i'm happy to um Happy to answer any queries. I, you know, when I was starting up, it, um, it, I got so much help from other people. I'm really happy to help anyone else who's starting setting up, just with explaining what I did, and um, and if they can learn from that, that's great. Awesome. Thanks so much, Al. Um, yeah. See, see you soon. I'll um, I'll put my email in the chat for this. If anyone wants to get in touch with anyone else, just drop me an email, and I'll I'll, I'll direct it. So th thanks so great. much, Al. I'll see you. See you soon. Thanks all. Bye. Um, if it's okay, I'd like to go back to the marketing question and direct that back to Alex and, and Doro um, to, to give the answers on that. And that was the question of how, you know, what's been the most effective market type, type of marketing that you've, that you've used? Um, yeah, for us, I think having, it's a bit different because the ships are, are, um, create a lot of content um, through the voyages and updates from the voyages. So there's a lot of, we've slowly, slowly over the years been building our uh, mainly Instagram following and um, we run events on Facebook for all the arrivals and for the deliveries. Um, but like Alice has said, our most reliable marketing that relates directly to sales is our newsletters, like a monthly newsletter that coincides with the closing of our order cycles. Um, but we've also, I we do a lot of like kind of traditional things as well, like getting posters up and, um, and, you know, making really beautiful postcards and dropping them in areas. I mean, yeah, we sort of tried everything, um, talking to local newspapers, um, community groups as well. So reaching out to any project or gather like group or anything in the local area and just, um, and yeah, and finding ways to collaborate. We now do a weekly Saturday morning market. And even though we don't often sell very much there now, like, well, we haven't done the last couple of weeks in January, it's still just a really great opportunity to talk to people and um, for people to see you because that kind of human interaction accounts for a lot. Like people don't normally just sign up to newsletters blind. It's normally because they've had a bit of an interaction or um yeah with what with the project already uh, yes that's it <laughs> um marketing wise at lookover uh, we have all the social media and um and we have a pretty big following there at the moment i'm kind of doubtful how like i think now that we have like a shop presence we probably still get most of that footfall even if we stop with social media but um, I think what's been amazing for publicity is just being controversial. Um, we kept pigs at an urban, like at like in a kind of urban community garden type uh, farm. And it was a huge scandal in Glasgow, made two newspaper front pages. 
and um, we had a like we had lots of people show up there every day and um, it was completely nuts and that was when we were a tiny shop and otherwise no one really had heard from us and it was just like a two-month social media frenzy and um, it was completely insane um, I'm not necessarily recommending it because it was kind of exhausting because we just get like basically people got upset that we kept pigs that we, that were then going to be made into meat um and uh, so we had, like all these protests against us and a petition and we got lots of phone calls um but it definitely engaged people in the idea of local food so it was kind of successful in that way um and then yeah so so basically Doing, doing something like that it's, it's, it makes you quite a well-known all of a sudden. Um, and other things that had a huge reach is basically when we say, hey, we're opening a new shop or hey, we're discontinuing Oatly because they've been like bought over by this investment firm that like gives money, invests into like fossil fuels. And that was that second, like, I think that was the most, like the, the social media post we did, it was the highest reach ever, I think. Like it was just insane. So, um, so that stuff. Uh, really does something but it's like if, if you want to deal with the fallout um, you kind of have to think about that <laughs> yeah so thanks Dory we've got we've only got five minutes left so there's a couple more questions in the chat um just before I go to the next question I just want to say um I want to invite Jade to introduce a session that we're going to be running um on the 2nd of February um Jade do you want to talk about the session quickly if that's okay yeah, we'd love if anybody wants to come. Um, it's um, a joint session between OFM and the project I work on, which is called Ready Healthy Eat. So some OFM um, members are going to speak um, and some um, people from my project are going to speak. The purpose of it is to um, for the organisations in my project to talk about how to address food poverty, which they're really good at. They're, four projects from around the UK who are really experts at um, sourcing waste food and distributing waste food um, and making ready meals at reaching people in most food need in community building um, with those groups are so super good at that what they need to know about is how to source more local food um, and how to begin to trade so that they can start to do some more social enterprise type work so that's the expertise they'd like to hear about from OFN members um, so if you're interested either in sharing how you trade on OFN and that might be of use to the food poverty projects or in beginning to explore how you meet food poverty yourselves but it's just in a small way um, it'd be really nice to see you there um, so we'll have little presentations and but the main thing I think will be a discussion between the food poverty groups and the groups that trade I've put my email in the chat, so I'll send you the Zoom link if you'd like to come, that'd be very nice. Um, and maybe, um, Kay, I'll, I'll give it to you as well, and you could put it on the um, OFN Facebook page or something like that, okay? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Thanks Jane. It'd be lovely to see some of you there if you'd like to come. It'd be very nice to see you. That's cool. it. Thanks. Thanks, Jade. I'll put um, Jade's email as well in both of the event pages um, for this event today, so you can find it there as well. Um, Cool, so the other question we had was about, um, it was from Yasmin about, does anyone do strictly online ordering? If so, how do you connect with people without computer access? And um, has anyone navigated language barriers? So that's, um, would anyone on the, would like to speak to, if anyone would like to speak about that? Um, we have um, order sheets in the physical shop as well for um, some of our elders who will just come in with their shopping list and we um, take their orders for them. Um, we've also got a customer support um, mobile number um, for people to use that as well. So that's just two ways we've um, um, developed really for people who aren't online or don't use email or Facebook. Awesome, thanks Candice. And um, I noticed Louise had posted as well in the chat about um, the phone buddy system, um, which is where some hubs have volunteers who phone up customers without internet who don't like who are or who aren't able to order online and place an order on their behalf using that method. So it's 
similar one. And just keeping an eye on time, it's two minutes two. Um, I'm just posting in the chat as well a feedback form for the session today. Um, so if anyone um, feels cool to, if you could fill out the feedback form um, for us, that would be really helpful. And another quick note on um, some of the topics that's come up about email marketing. Next week's webinar on Tuesday will be all about email marketing. So it'll be mostly a Q&A session, so you can come with your specific questions as well as maybe 15 minutes um, from me. So it'd be really great to see you there. It'll be at the same time. No, it'll be an hour earlier next week, so doing four till five. Um, so we've got one minute for any last questions. If anyone would now like to just um, unmute and jump in with a question, that's that's welcome. Otherwise, we'll wrap up. Cool. Okay. So thanks everyone for coming, and thank you so much for our speakers. It's been so fascinating to hear um, so more details about your amazing food enterprises. So thanks so much for sharing today. Um, I'll be sharing the video um, for this session in the Facebook group that we have, Thriving Food Hubs. I'm going to share a link as well in a second if anyone would like to join it, and also my email address. Um, but yeah, so thanks everyone for coming and hope to see you either next week in the email marketing webinar or next time. Um, cook. So thanks everyone. Have a great week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.